Father, thank you that you are good. Thank you that you are full of riches. Thank you for your grace towards us at all the different times in our lives, as we've already heard this morning. And Father, I pray that you will continue to reveal your goodness to us as we look at your word. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak through me. I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to every heart here. We lift up the name of Jesus. We declare every, every spirit that is opposed to Jesus is bound in Jesus' name. We thank you for the power of the blood, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God. Amen. Just going to ask you, if you've got a mobile phone, please could you put that on silent? Thank you. A few years ago, Radio 4 broadcast an item about silence. And they wanted to explore this whole issue because people were questioning whether society had become too noisy. As part of the program, they decided they were going to broadcast two minutes of silence live and then ask people to write in to say how they found it. So they broadcast the two, two minutes of silence. And people sent messages saying how profoundly impacted they were by this shared experience of silence. One lady said that when the silence came on, her dog got really excited because she thought it was time to go for a walk. One man said that he was really disappointed because just as they were broadcasting the silence, he drove through a tunnel, so he lost the signal and he didn't hear any of it. <laughs> he asked them if they could broadcast it again. The fact that the uh, radio programmes see silence as a uh, uh, something to make a program about shows what an unusual experience it is in our society. But it's nothing new to have a noisy society. 500 years ago, the French philosopher Blaise Pascal said this, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. That's probably an exaggeration. But it's interesting to note that even that long ago, he was looking around thinking, society is noisy. I want a bit more quiet. Because probably the, the problem isn't so much society. It's in our hearts. Maybe there's something about us that is a little bit scared of the silence. So this morning, I want to uh, look at how we can experience silence in a healthy way. And silence isn't about being alone with our thoughts so much as being alone in the presence of God, making unhurried space for God and allowing him to come in in a way, in a, in a way that we may otherwise miss. I'm going to read to you from the story of Elijah in 1 Kings 19, 9 to 13. Then Elijah went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. 
After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? God comes to us in different ways. And the ways that God may have come to us in the past may not be the way that he comes to us today. In the past, God was in the wind. When the Israelites passed through the Red Sea, it said that God sent a strong east wind to drive the waters back. God was in the wind, but on this occasion, he isn't. In the past, God was in the earthquake. When they received the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, it says that the mountain trembled. God was in the earthquake, but on this occasion, he's not. And in the past, God was in the fire. He appeared to Moses in a burning bush. And Elijah himself had seen God come down or send fire down on Mount Carmel. God was in the fire. But on this occasion, he's not. He's not in any of those things. He's in the gentle whisper. Now, other translations say still small voice or whistling of gentle air. Some say the correct translation is a sound of sheer silence. Perhaps in the past we've encountered God in the noisy, the dramatic, the busy. There are many ways that God can come to us, but perhaps we've neglected the silence, the riches that God wants to give us in the quiet place. I'm going to read to you from Psalm 131. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. So I want us to notice a, a few things about this psalm. Firstly, he says that he has calmed and quieted his soul. Now, what, what does that mean? What does that look like? I want you to imagine a, a jar full of river water. You shake it up, and the sediment fills the jar with the water, and it, it's, it's washing around. If you keep shaking that jar, it will always be a dark brownish color and you will never see the clarity of the water. But if you put the jar down and leave it and wait, that sediment will sink to the bottom and you will be able to see clearly, the water will become clear. Our minds, our souls are like that jar we have lots of thoughts racing round. We're busy in our minds. Our souls have got anxieties, fears, all sorts of thoughts we, we like or we don't like rushing round us. And those things can stop us from seeing clearly what God is saying or where God is at. When we take the time to be still and quiet, 
that sediment starts to settle. And over time, we begin to see clearly. Let's take the time to calm and quiet our souls when we come before God. David, the psalmist, compares himself to a weaned child. Now, I want to, as best I can, explain what, what is meant by weaned child, but not everyone agrees on what the original uh, language meant. So weaned child means a child that is just past the age of breastfeeding. So a young child. Um, why does David choose a young child as an illustration of calmness and quietness? <laughs> Some say that it means not so much a child that's past the age of breastfeeding, but a child that has just been breastfed and is satisfied and is quiet. The, the point is, though, it, it's a young child with their mother quietly enjoying the comfort of their mother's arms, rest, peace, security. Usually, in the Bible, God is revealed as a father. He is a father. But here, we see an aspect of God's character being compared to a mother, a mother holding her child. Now, when we come before God in silence... I believe we begin to experience God's love, his comfort, his security, perhaps in a way that we may otherwise miss if we're busy with our thoughts, our minds, our lives. And finally, David says, O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. D Darren was speaking earlier about hope and uh, how he found hope in Jesus, but maybe at times that hope has waned. I believe that David here, by spending time with a quiet soul before God, discovers afresh the hope of God, that God is fully trustworthy. And so from that place, he is able to bring a simple message to his people. Put your hope in God. I believe that as we spend time alone with God, we also find um, the strength, the message, the heart, the love of God that we can communicate to others at the right time. I want to uh, go through with you some simple steps to being silent. Number one, find a room where you can be alone. Perhaps sit in your favorite armchair, or if it's not practical to be alone, maybe go for a walk and find a, something, somewhere you can sit in the woods or in a park, but somewhere where you can be alone, at ease and comfortable. Get rid of all distractions. That includes your mobile phone. <laughs> um, Perhaps turn your mobile phone off. Perhaps leave it in another room. In the quiet, say a simple prayer to God in your heart. Something like this. Here I am, Lord. I want you to be with me. And I want to be with you. And then be quiet. One of the reasons I like that prayer is when I say, here I am, Lord, what I mean is, here I am, all of me, the good bits, the bad bits, the bits that don't feel like I've had a very good week or been very good this week, it's all of me, God. And that's who God wants. He doesn't want me putting on a mask. He doesn't want me to pretend to be something that I'm not. I just present myself to God. I'm receiving his invitation, here I am. I am, I want to be with you. I want you to be with me and I want to be with you. Another prayer you might have instead is simply, speak Lord, for your servant is listening. You remember Julia spoke about that a few weeks ago. Either way, just a simple prayer and then be quiet before God. 
If your mind starts to wander, and it will, just repeat the prayer again. Here I am, Lord. I want you to be with me, and I want to be with you. Sometimes it's uncomfortable being silent because things come up in you that you may prefer to avoid. Maybe it's anxieties, maybe it's anger, maybe you feel ashamed. I want to suggest to you another really good prayer. When you discover something in yourself, rather than running away from God because it's uncomfortable, just stay where you are and say, God, I'm feeling angry about this situation. What are we going to do about that? I love that prayer, what are we going to do about it? Um, it might be, God, I'm anxious about the future. What are we going to do about that? Whatever it might be, what are we going to do about it, God? It's not me saying, God, sort me out and I'll, you know, do it all yourself. And it's not me saying, God, I'm going to sort myself out and then I'll be back. It's what are we going to do about it? God changing our hearts is us cooperating with him as he shows us things and as he reveals the truth that sets us free. So how long should you be silent for? That's the wrong question. <laughs> it will be different for different people. Maybe for some people it's a short time, maybe it's longer. Um, the important thing is that we give unhurried space for God. If you're in a hurry, if you're constantly thinking about what you're going to do next, you're not going to find the, the full benefit of being silent before God. Leslie and I visited a friend last Saturday, and she's just been ordained as a curate in the Church of England. And she's been given a, a sort of a flat, um, what, what you call a curatage, that's a, a word I learned last week, um, where the curate lives. A very simple, small flat. But on the side, there's a, a room, which is uh, a small library, an office, and a prayer room. Very small, but it's, we, we were, um, had the opportunity to use that as a prayer room, and it's beautiful. So it faces the east, and in the morning, you see the sun coming up, and it shines through the window onto the armchair where you're praying. It's very easy to be still, to be quiet, to enjoy um, the, the, the presence of God in the morning. On the last day we were there, I jokingly said in my heart, oh, I'd love to take this prayer room with me. And I felt maybe the Holy Spirit saying, there's certainly a thought that came to me, you can. You can take the prayer room with you. Maybe not literally, metaphorically, what you enjoy, what you experience in the quiet, you take with you into the day. So it's not a case of, thanks God, see you tomorrow. It's becoming aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives in a way that impacts every area of our lives. Brother Lawrence, a monk from centuries ago, wrote a book called Practicing the Presence of God. And he said that he was able to be as aware of God's presence in a busy kitchen as he was in the prayer room. Now, some people say, oh, that shows that you don't need time alone because you can just experience God in every area of life. But if you read his book, what he's actually saying is that because he's learned to be alone with God and because he has punctuated his life with times of separation and stillness and quietness, when he gets into the busyness, the, uh, he's aware of the presence and the love of God then as well. So that's a few thoughts about how we can be silent on our own. But we can also be silent together and experience God's presence and love in the silence together. Silence and solitude go hand in hand, but... Um, when we're together, there are opportunities for silence as well. So I'm going to read to you. Uh, hmm. 
Oh, got the wrong scripture. <laughs> I'm going to read it to you. So Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 2 says this. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. So I want to suggest three ways that we can do silence together as a congregation. Firstly, perhaps simply as part of our worship times, occasionally we stop and have a couple of minutes of silence, stillness, where we're not, we're not going to be prophesying or speaking in tongues, we're just going to be quiet and allow God to be God. Secondly, in, in the bread and wine, there are opportunities for silence. I really appreciated the way Mim led the bread and wine today, had a time of silence at the beginning where we can search our hearts in and be before God. Often, bread and wine is very noisy, and it's us talking to each other. It's, we're not concerned about children or babies crying, that, that's not an issue. It's more that we're talking to each other when we could be focusing on the bread and wine. And it's not so much that I think that's irreverent or disrespectful, although it could be depending on what's in our hearts. It's more that it's a lost opportunity. We have plenty of opportunity to talk to each other. Maybe the bread and wine just needs to be a time of quiet reflection, inviting God to come and be present with us again. Another way we could do silence together is at mealtimes. Perhaps instead of a, a quick grace time, a quick prayer, maybe just be still for a couple of minutes before we eat and allow the sediment to settle in our souls in the middle of a busy day. Maybe the things that have annoyed us during the day, let's just be still, allow the water to clear. I believe that silence is both the easiest thing in the world and the hardest thing in the world. It's the easiest thing in the world because you don't need to do anything. You don't need to think of clever words to pray. You just need to hear God's invitation to join him in the silence and respond to him. But it's the hardest thing in the world Because if we're honest, we like being busy. We like our minds to be filled with things. Maybe we like to be distracted. Maybe we don't like being alone with our thoughts. But I want to encourage all of us to add silence to the ways that we engage with God. There are great treasures to be found with God in the silence. So I'll finish with a quote from Ruth Barton, who wrote a book about silence. She said, there is nothing that fills like the love that is God. There is nothing that transforms like the presence that is God. And there is nothing else that produces what the silence of God produces within the human soul. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to hand over to Leslie, who's going to lead us in a short silence. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you that you enjoy your people. Thank you that you invite us into your presence. Thank you that you enjoy being with us. And Father, I guess we can all respond in different ways to this. You know what we need. But God, I pray that you will speak to each of us and lead us and show us how we can make the most of silence in our lives. Thank you, God. Amen.
So this is just a, a small illustration we can do at home. Uh, we practice now together for two minutes. Uh, I will light the candle as a symbol of welcome the Holy Spirit to come to our midst. And as I light the candle, you can look at the candle to still your mind. You can close your eyes um, to be quiet. And in that quietness, that silence, let the Holy Spirit speak. Here I am, here we are, Lord. We want to be in your presence, and we want you to be with us. Father, we thank you in this stillness you reach out to us. We thank you in this stillness you root us deeply in your love. May you continue to guide us to enter that stillness as we begin the week of life, busy life, we find you there, and we find life. In Jesus' name, amen.